There are many arguments that people have come up with to try to disprove the concept of a rapture occurring before the beginning of the tribulation. So what about it? Are the arguments valid? Is the concept of a pre-tribulation rapture wishful thinking? Stay tuned for an interview with one of Christendom's foremost authorities on the rapture. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My co-host Nathan Jones and I have as our special guest a renowned Bible prophecy teacher, Dr. Tommy Ice. Tommy is the head of the Pre-Trib Research Center and is a prolific writer on all aspects of Bible prophecy. Tommy, welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you, Dave. Well, we're glad to have you. Good to have you here. Thank you, Nathan. I have two questions I'd like to open up. One, since some people might not know, what is the rapture? Because that's what we're talking about. And two, what is the pre-trib rapture? Well, the rapture uh, refers to people who are alive, who are uh, members of the church of Jesus Christ, they're saved, who are taken up to heaven in a moment of time. And so, in essence, uh, that is when the resurrection of the church will occur in conjunction with it. But the rapture and the resurrection are two separate Events because the rapture is for living people, the resurrection is for dead people, but both end up in their new resurrection bodies and they meet Christ in the cloud and follow him back to the Father's house, as John 14 says. And the pre tribulational rapture is uh, the belief that that event is separate from the second coming. Okay. And it will take place before the 70th week of Daniel, the seven year period of the tribulation. And Hence pre-trib. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, now, mm. what, uh, what scripture is this based on, the concept of the rapture? Well, Jesus introduced it in the Upper Room Discourse less than 24 hours before he died. And if you look at the Upper Room Discourse, uh, Christ said three times, and that is John 13 through 16. Right. And uh, he says there that three times that... Uh, there's too much for you to understand, but when He, the Spirit of Truth, comes, the Holy Spirit, He will guide you into all things. I think that's referring to the apostles, and He, every doctrine from chapter 14 onward is brand new. It's church truth, so to speak, and so you have the seed plot for what is later developed in the New Testament, and you have John 14, where Christ said that He's going to come back and take them to himself. Some say receive, uh, but it's a word that means for him to take us to himself and return with us to the Father's house. And of course that is then expanded upon by the apostles as Christ predicted in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. In fact it's amazing you look at the structural analysis of of what Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 3, and what Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians 4, 12 through, 16, through uh, 18. And the, you have the same sequence of events there. And so it's very clear they're talking about the same event. Well, talk about the sequence of events in 1 Thessalonians. What does Paul say is going to happen when the rapture occurs? Right. He's going to, Christ is going to uh, give a command. Okay. And it apparently will be passed down like we do in the military uh, through an echelon. And then there's going to be a blowing of a trumpet, right? Yes. And then that's the general command. And in that moment, and we know uh, from 1 Corinthians 15 that it w says it will be in the twinkling of an eye. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will be taken up, the snatched dead up. Yeah, the dead will raise first because they have six feet. Further to go, as he always says. <laughs> yeah. Well, pure speculation. Okay. And uh, then you have uh, believers being caught up together with them into the clouds. So, and so then, you're talking about a bodily resurrection at that point. That's correct. And then the believers will be translated on the way up. That's right. Mortal to immortal. Mm -hmm. Wow, what an event. It is. And then we'll be taken to heaven. And we know from other passages that we'll experience the beam of judgment during the tribulation period and all of this and return with Christ 
uh, at the second coming. Well, now, a lot of people, in fact, probably the majority viewpoint in Christendom today is that of uh, combining the second coming with the rapture. There's going to be kind of a yo-yo rapture. You're, you're taken up, you come right back down at the end of the tribulation. It's all one event. Uh, why isn't that, that correct? Well, there's a lot of reasons because when you look at the passages that talk about what we call our catching up the rapture passages, the nature of the event is qualitatively different than the nature of the event related to the second coming. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of differences. And basically, it's Christ coming for his church uh, versus the second coming where he's coming with his church. The saints come back with him. And uh, so when you analyze these, you see that they're they're different. And then uh, when you realize that the you know, there are passages and promises throughout the New Testament, especially in Paul's writings, that we're going to escape the wrath of God mm-hmm. and uh, the coming wrath, he calls it in First Thessalonians. And so the term wrath is one of the 23 terms used in the Old Testament to describe the 70th week of Daniel. And so it's a technical term. Uh, and he's saying that the church will not pass through the, ra- uh, through the wrath of God. And uh, so it's like uh, the fact that the church is going to be caught up in the air, and right before the second coming, according to Revelation 19, the church will be married. So if the church were to go through any part of the tribulation, it would be like Christ beating up his bride, <laughs> you know, then saying, hey, babe, let's get married, you know. Well, very quickly, uh, tell us uh, what is the Pre-Trib Research Center? Well, it's an organization started back in 1994 uh, by Tim LaHaye and myself, actually in 92, by Tim LaHaye and myself to research, teach, and defend the pre-tribulational rapture and related Bible prophecy doctrines. And it revolves primarily around our annual conference where we have people like yourself Mm -hmm. and others who are experts in areas, and we'll usually take a topic uh, like Israel, or last year was the the rapture, because it was our 20th anniversary, and we dealt, you know, with, uh, had people present papers, and these are, it's a little on the academic side, because uh, we think this is what people need uh, to give ammo from the Bible you know, and so we interact and deal with a lot of people that oppose our views, and uh, as well as presenting uh, the truth of what the scriptures say about this. Now, you're the full-time director of this, right? Right. Okay, and you're available for speaking. Right. Okay. Well, at the end of our program, we'll let you tell people how they can get in touch with you to do okay. that. We're going to pause for just a moment, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to put you on the hot seat because Nathan and I are going to begin to bombard you with arguments against the pre-tribulation rapture. So, get ready with your defenses. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy, our interview of Dr. Tommy Ice concerning the rapture. Tommy, I want to start off this segment by saying uh, that many argue that the rapture has to be a uh, unbiblical concept because the word's not even found in the Bible. Well, it depends on what Bible you read. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, the Greek word in the original language was harpazo. Okay. We get our word harpoon and stuff like that from there, which means to seize. Uh, and uh, take suddenly with force. In fact, it's the same word that's used of the s- soldiers taking Jesus away so, so you're talking uh, from about the Garden of Gethsemane. Four where it talks yes. about caught up. Yes, the word, the word is caught hard. up. Yeah. And they could have translated it rapture. They could have translated to snatch up. In the fact, great they did snatch. translate it as rapture in the Latin version, didn't Rapio. they? Well, yes. In fact, Jerome, in around 400, when he did the Vulgate, which as you... Mm-hmm. We were saying when off air a while ago that uh, it was 1,500 years. It was the main Bible that everybody used. But in Europe, where you during the Reformation period, uh, you had people from different countries that right. spoke different languages. When they come together, they spoke Latin. And so this is why we have a lot of Latin terms right. like Trinity, you know, that are not in the Bible. And it, starting in the 1600s, people started using in scholarly circles the word rapture to refer to uh, the harpazo or the catching up. And I have probably about 115, 20 commentaries on First Thessalonians and Virtually every one of those use the word rapture mm-hmm. in that 
those commentaries because it's a, another term to refer to the, the catching up. And, it, and because it's a big event in Christendom, then, of course, it, there's a special word that's used for that. And so that's how it came into parlance and air, air uh, usage. And so the, the concept of rapture is taught in the Bible. Okay. It's so much easier to say rapture than the great snatching up or yes. the great catching away. And First Thessalonians 4.17 has it. Some will argue, though, that the rapture is too new a concept. It was only invented during Darby in the 1800s. There's no history to the rapture being taught in the church. Is that yeah. true? Too new to be true. Well, uh, it is in a certain sense. But in another sense, uh, we're getting uh, today where you have access to literature and all this. And we're finding that in periods where people studied the Bible, for example, the Puritans, in the 1600s was a great Bible study movement because uh, after 1,500 years of basic illiteracy uh, throughout the world where only one in two and a half thousand people could read, uh, and, you know, if you look at church history, only about one every 40 years even knew Hebrew in the church, let alone Greek. Uh, you, you had the learning in the 1500s of Greek and Hebrew and the translation of the Bible into people's language. And right. as a result, for the first time really in history, uh, an average person had access to a Bible because right. you had the rise of the middle class and they could afford them. And you also had uh, the average person learning how to read. Right. And uh, they started studying the Bible and people started talking about premillennialism, the rapture and all of this, and Israel. And uh, during the Middle Ages, this stuff could be controlled by a few. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, the church was very anti-Israel, very anti-Semitic, oh, yes. and didn't want anybody to even know about the Jewish roots of the church. That's right. In yeah. fact, uh, most people uh, in the, during those first 1,500 years would have thought that Jesus was not Jewish right. Right. at all because you know, he criticized the scribes and Pharisees, and they would use that against so him. So basically what you're saying is that once people got the Bible in their own languages in the 1500s, in the 16th century, they got it in their own languages, and once they could read... right. They began to interpret the Bible and, yes. and, and say, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. See, the average person for the first 1,500 years uh, just knew the big events. Yeah. They didn't know the details, especially of the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, they knew the creation, the flood, and, and a few and other events. And the facts about Jesus' life. In fact, if you go into cathedrals in Europe today, you every one of them has the life of Jesus painted on the walls all around. And they would take them in and say, all right, he was born of a virgin. So yes. go around. And that's all they knew. That's all they knew. And if they had a question, they would ask their priest who couldn't even read. Historically, you know, though, I mean, the idea that it wasn't even taught... I mean, I found it in uh, Barnabas, 100, 105, Papias, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, Tertullian, Hippolytus. You go in the Middle well, Ages. Well, that's premillennialism. I'm I mean, not so sure about a pre trib rapture. Ephraim of Nisibius, Alfred Codex. Uh, then you got Increase Mather, uh, Philip Doddridge. All these guys were about 16, 1700s, and they were right. teaching the concepts around the basis for a pre trib, not necessarily a pre trib rapture, but the, the central tenet that Jesus was returning and it was separate from the second coming, right? Right. We basically have, I mean, we found the pseudo Ephraim, you know, in the fourth century. Yeah. We have recently found one even uh, sooner in the uh, apocalypse of uh, Elijah well, and of course, uh, from that, North Africa. That points to another thing, and that is that even if people wrote about this, if it's different from the church doctrine, not only were they burned at the stake, but their, their writings were burned. A lot of writings were lost. Exactly. And they they were suppressed, especially starting around the year 500. Yes. Uh, and, you know, Jerome set away with a thousand years in his Daniel commentary. Augustine shifted from premillennial to right. amillennialism. And what you had in North Africa is uh, Alexandria had become the center of Greek philosophy. Right. It had moved from Athens to Alexandria. And that uh, they, they hated, for some reason, the idea that we were going to have a literal physical kingdom. Well, you know, uh, when people say it's too new to be true, one time I was thinking about that, and it suddenly occurred to me, if you're going to go with that argument, then you would have to say that salvation by grace through faith is too new to be true. Exactly. Because, or, hey, come on. 1,500 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or the substitutionary atonement with Anselm yeah. in the year 1,000. was, And particularly with Bible prophecy, because the right. Bible says itself... Many things about Bible prophecy will not be understood until the time comes for them to be understood. That's right. 
And you ha- so you have a development of the church understanding right. its doctrine. So the early church was futurist like us. Yes. They believed in a, a, a literal tribulation, a literal. Right. But they st- the biggest thing missing actually from the theology of the early church is their anti-Israel attitude that they developed. Yes. And uh, it's not until the Puritans basically uh, reestablished, and, and this is where we get the idea of Judeo-Christianity. You, it didn't come from Europe. You have it developing in the English-speaking world primarily from the Puritans yes. who uh, fell in love with the Old Testament and our Puritan forefathers in America because we did not have the uh, European anti-Semitic medieval tradition that they have. And that's why Americans are probably more open to Bible prophecy and all of this compared to the rest of Christendom. And as a result, uh, they started studying the Old Testament. And, and it still took another couple hundred years till the late 1700s, early 1800s to begin to see a distinction between Israel and the church. And that's when people, when they saw that, they were open to the idea of a rapture because the church had to be removed before God could finish his plan and program with Israel during the 70th week. Okay, now this brings us to another uh, argument against the pre-trib rapture that I consider silly, but it, I have to mention it because we just hear about it all the time. A fellow by the name of Dave McPherson wrote a book a number of years ago in which he tried to debunk the rapture, the pre-trib rapture, and he argued that the whole concept came from a teenage girl who had a, went into ecstasy and to sort of a, I don't know, a, a, and, and began to speak a, uh, led by the Holy Spirit or something, or a demonic spirit or whatever, to, to tell about the, the, the rapture of the church, and that Darby stole this idea from her. Right. And he's published this book under about 10 different names. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But that has been disseminated very widely. In fact, Dave McPherson used to call me on the phone. <laughs> he, he, he lived in, he, yes. you talk, he was a very parano- paranoid guy. He lived in an earth home in Utah. <laughs> And he hated computers. He, I think he had just gotten one last I'd heard. And uh, he talks about how when he was first going to write this, his normally docile dog named Rolf, uh, you know, savagely bit his writing hand and, <laughs> and postponed for three months the event of writing this information uh, because he became demon possessed. But <laughs> ne- nevertheless, uh, I've talked with him many times over the years and uh, the and I have spent, I, I, in fact, in 2003, I went on a month trip over to Great Britain to the libraries to research all of this. And I found that basically Darby came up with the idea of preacher rapture uh, during December 1827 and January 1828. Okay, the Margaret McDonald event didn't occur till April of 1830. Yeah. So at least three years before, three and a half years before right. uh, she is alleged to have uh, done this, Darby had already talked about this. And I've documented it through two letters. Uh, one was uh, for, uh, Francis Newman's Stages of Life. He's uh, the brother, younger brother of Bishop Newman, Cardinal Newman, rather. And uh, he was the uh, tutor of Darby's sister's family who lived in Dublin and Darby was recuperating there at her yeah. house and he talks about Darby coming up with a rapture yeah. uh, back then during his convalescence from well, the, the thing that gets me about this book is I finally I had so many questions about it. I got the book and I read it yes and he talks about how all this came from this teenage girl in a trance then in the back he has the trance I mean he has yes. a, 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 a transcription of it there are two versions of it by well, the way well I read that thing <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. I might have read it 50 times, and I couldn't find a pre-trib right. it's rapture not there. In anywhere. It's not there. <laughs> but that, the Irvinites were a totally different movement who still were historicist, you know, and th- what they were teaching is something that goes all the way back to the early 1600s, uh, and it taught that anywhere from a few days to 45 days, there would be a catching up a rapture of people in conjunction with the second coming after the tribulation, you see. And therefore, they would hover up in the air while the earth was burnt up. That's oh. called a conflagration of the earth from second Never period heard three. One. Yes. Uh-huh. And Joseph Mead came up with this, who's the father of British premillennialism in the 1620s. And uh, that, if, if that was a pre-trib rapture, 
which the uh, Irvinites were teaching, uh, because this lady is uh, connected with what's called the Irvinite movement or the Catholic Apostolic Church, then people have been teaching the preacher of rapture yeah. for 400 years by the time Darby came along. What's sad, too, is that most people, when they talk about preacher of rapture, that's all they know about is they'll bring up Margaret MacDonald and they'll say, well, it's too new, so they'll discount it. But they have no idea what the concept of the preacher of rapture is. And then we got people who talk about a pre-wrath rapture or a mid-trib rapture. Can you debunk those theories? Well, uh you know, the, the mid-trib rapture is kind of like, uh, you know, a guy from the north and the south, uh, from the north. Well, he couldn't decide whether he wanted to be on the north or the south during the Civil War, and he put on a gray top and a blue bottom, and he gets shot from both sides. You know, uh, because okay. you've got the church going through half of the tribulation and being taken out in the middle. And the Bible clearly teaches uh, in Revelation 6 that the first part of the tribulation is the wrath of God. You know, in fact, it says, who will protect us from the wrath of the Lamb who sits on the throne? And uh, it's called, the entire period is called the wrath of God. So you, you violate the clear scripture teaching if you go through any part of the tribulation, because the, the so-called pre-wrath, uh, pre-tribs or pre-wrath... Uh, is yeah. a three-quarters rapture view, but they don't like that, or they would say about a three-quarter rapture view. And so you've got people going through the, the 70th week of Daniel, the church, when, when uh, Daniel 9.24 says it's for Israel and not for the, it doesn't say not for the church, but it's very clear it's for Israel. So they, they see the bold judgments at the end only being the wrath of God, even though Jesus is the one who opens the very first seal, right? Right. They, they ch instead of seeing the multiple descriptions that describe the entire seven-year tribulation and the different facets of it, they take different terms that refer to the tribulation and they chop them up into segments. And argue that the, all of the wrath at the uh, beginning is the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan as if right. God is not the sovereign. The term wrath of man is not used. I know. Yes. But I mean, God is sovereign here. Sure. And if he's going to allow wrath, it's still his wrath. Yeah, but exactly, and we're not gonna we're gonna be kept from that hour, as Revelation three ten. Speaking of kept from, many people say, well, the problem with you guys who believe in a pre-trib rapture is you're just a bunch of escapists. Yeah. What do you say about that? Well, I would say that uh, tell that to all the millions of martyrs. <laughs> Uh, and people have been persecuted for the faith. See, in Revelation 3.10, he talks about how that church has, has been faithful through uh, the, the time of, in essence, the church age. Yeah. So we're not saying, a lot of people say, well, you know, we got to go through persecution. And I say, well, that's an American uh, viewpoint because we happen to live in a time, unique time in America where we haven't been persecuted. Yep. But most Christians down through history and okay. in other parts of the world have been, been persecuted. Go to Saudi Arabia and start doing street evangelism if you yeah. want to be persecuted. And, and persecution's coming here as well. It's coming, but the point is is that the church age is a time in which we have tribulations yes. and we're persecuted. In fact, there's a lot of talk about it. Uh, and it's not talking about that because that is the wrath of man or Satan. But the tribulation is said to be the wrath of God. In fact, it's all throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament. This is the time when God is going to judge. He's going to use wrath to purge out the rebel in order to convert the Jews. And secondly, he's going to, uh, to judge the earth dwellers uh, for rejecting Christ. Well, you know, when people tell me I'm an escapist, I say, well, did you know Jesus Christ was one? He said in Luke 21, pray that you may escape these things. That's true. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> he seems to be anticipating yeah. something there. <laughs> what would you say is the most single most important argument in behalf of a pre-trib rapture? Well, it's hard to come up with a single most thing, Dave, because there you know, it's somewhat complicated in the sense that there are many factors that contribute to it. And just like the Trinity is, is complicated. What about imminence? Well, yeah, the fact that Christ could come at any moment uh, is one of those. And how could he come except through a preacher of rapture? He can't come in the second coming because there's too many prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. Right. I, don't, I shouldn't look for him today if I don't believe in the rapture. Right. And there are, in the New Testament epistles primarily, there are these comments about how we're to be ready at any moment because Christ could come. But 
you have, for example, Luke 21, where he says, when you see this, he's talking about the first events of the tribulation. He says, the end is not yet. And then he says, when you see this, talking about the midpoint and the abomination of desolation, the end is not yet. And then when he's at the end in verse 28 of Luke 21, he says, but when you see this, talking about the second coming, then it says, look up for your redemption draws nigh. So obviously when you're, when you're in signs are involved, those are referring to the tribulation of signs leading up to the second coming. But the rapture is something that we're to always be ready for. That's why you can't date it. I asked it out for a date one time and, <laughs> and it said, I can't, you know, I, I mean, I may or may not, you know. So that means um, then there are no prophecies that need to be fulfilled for, before the rapture happens. That's right. But there, but okay. things can happen like Israel coming back sure. to the land and, yeah. pre, and those are prep. They're not signs of the rapture. They're related to the tribulation events that are going to follow the rapture. Okay. Separate then. So if, if mm. you see Thanksgiving, you know Christmas is near, you see. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy, an interview of Bible prophecy expert Dr. Tommy Ice, who serves as the director of the Pre Trib Research Center. Now, Dr. Ice, you said you're available for speaking engagements. Maybe you could tell our folks in the camera there how they can get in touch with you and what's on your website. Uh, they can get in touch with me at, at uh, pre-trib.org on the World Wide Web. And uh, we have our news, uh, monthly newsletter with Tim LaHaye and myself there as well. Yes, and I want to emphasize that. I, I, it's an outstanding newsletter. It always has Tim's picture on one side and your picture on the other and major columns by each of you. And uh, in addition to that, you also have guest writers, so some of the best. And uh, so, folks, I really encourage you. Uh, to contact uh, that website, to get on that mailing list, and also invite uh, Tommy to come to your church and do a weekend conference, and it, you'll be greatly blessed by it. Well, Nathan, I guess that's it for this week. I want to thank you again, Tommy, for being with us. And folks, until next week, uh, this is Dave Reagan speaking for myself and Nathan Jones saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Dr. David Reagan's book, God's Plan for the Ages, contains a comprehensive overview of all aspects of Bible prophecy. It's written in an easy-to-understand, down-to-earth style that you will find appealing. In addition to all the prophecies concerning the first and second comings of the Messiah, it deals with a host of other prophetic questions, such as, what happens when you die? What will heaven be like? What's the future of the earth? Where is the United States in prophecy? When is the rapture most likely to occur? Is the Antichrist alive today? Are there signs of the times that are unique to our day and age? The book contains a variety of charts and diagrams which illustrate various aspects of Bible prophecy. The book is available for a gift of $15 or more plus shipping. Please call the number you see on the screen. Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time and ask for it by name or order online at lamblion.com. The book contains 42 exciting chapters about Bible prophecy and runs a total of 415 pages. Again, it can be yours for a gift of $15 or more plus shipping. Call the number you see on the screen or go to our website at lamblion.com. Consider ordering an extra copy for your pastor or church library. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 